hello there. Thank you for joining me for this week's edition of Telil 24-7. I'm your host, Adam Cook. On this week's show, we catch up with a couple of items from the recent Committee of the Whole meeting for Richmond Municipal Council, and we'll get the view from Mulgrave as we speak to a town councillor there who has roots in Richmond County, Krista Luddington. And we'll finish the show with another edition of our Fast Five game. But we begin Tell Ill 24-7 this week with an interview with the Recreation and Marketing Director for the Town of Port Hawkesbury. Michelle Farrow, a native of West Arishat, has been in her position for just over a year and she's getting ready for some exciting times coming up over the next few weeks as Port Hawkesbury relaunches its traditional Festival of the Strait and the Granville Green Outdoor Concert Series. So here's my conversation with Michelle Farrow at her office at the Port Hawkesbury Civic Centre. Michelle, we're glad to talk to you today because your job is very different right now than it was when you first took it on a year ago. And when we first spoke to you in August of last year, COVID-19 restrictions were lifted across Nova Scotia on March 21st. So obviously you have a little more leeway to plan events for the town. Can you give us a sense on what that mind frame is like for you and what it's been like climbing out of the last few months and getting ready for this stage of the summer? Yeah, I mean, I think it's it's uh, sort of in the nature of the work anyway to be um, a little bit reactive and to uh, ebb and flow with uh, restrictions of any kind. So I think we were we were really well able to um, adjust as we needed to and uh, and still continue to provide um, some shows um, within the restrictions, um, particularly tunes on the trails, which was a huge uh, success over those five weeks. Um, in August and September. We had some great turnouts for that program and uh, our artists were uh, very eager and excited to get back out performing in front of people. So uh, we were very happy to do that. And then as time sort of moved on into the fall and winter, um, we just sort of adjusted as we as we needed to um, and as necessary based on the current health restrictions at those times. So I'm still able to do a few shows and, um, you know, certainly welcomed the big announcement of uh, sort of being able to open up again. Well, I imagine for you and for many people in your type of position, the arrival of March 21st might have seemed like a big red curtain being raised up. And I'm wondering, was that the case for you? Did you really feel like you had much more leeway to take on events? Yeah, uh, that is exactly how I would uh, how I would describe it. And it's really just it was the green light uh, sort of to go ahead with everything that we had been planning um, up to that point and beyond. So, you know, uh, Graham, uh, an event like Granville Green, for example, it takes a good six months to plan an event like that. So. The planning was always happening in the background, um, and but that announcement just gave the green light to you know to confirm and to move forward and to um, to start getting excited about you know uh, about being able to deliver the event um, as we normally would um, pre-pandemic. So, what has it been like since then for you and your staff here in your capacities with marketing, recreation, tourism, and culture? to not only plan events, but to plan events for Port Hawkesbury, knowing we have been warned that new waves could come in the fall or the winter. What has it all been like for you folks since then? Yeah, I mean, I think, um, I, you know, I can only speak for myself, I guess, but I think also people in general have just become a little bit more adaptable to change and uh, people who are in the event planning world, um, they were all doing, they were all operating under the same, um, sort of guidelines and restrictions. So, you know, when, you, when you're booking something and you have to say, well, this is tentative though. And they're like, I know, I know, I understand. So, you know, I think everybody for the most part stayed pretty positive about it and um, just really, really flexible and welcoming. And so then when we got the green light, it was just like, yes, let's do this. You know, we're ready. We were ready. So what has it been like then for you to welcome people back to venues like this one, like the Port Hawkesbury Civic Center for various programs? I know there have been some successful music events here at the Civic Center. Meanwhile, there's also been after school programs and March break programs. What has it been like seeing those faces again? And in many cases, seeing unmasked 
faces again at Port Hawkesbury events. It's been really exciting and it's really my first taste of it um, since I've joined here at the town of Port Hawkesbury because I joined at such a transitional time and at a time with so many restrictions. So it was, you know, I'm thinking back, like you mentioned March break, that was really the first time that I got to see how excited people were to get out and um, those programs were just filled up instantly. So it really just spoke to how ready people are um, to get back out there and, and to enjoy and to um, take advantage of those opportunities for themselves and um, particularly at that time um, for their children. So um, and since then, it has just been a literal whirlwind of, um, you know, the spaces are filling every day at the Civic Center and people are booking, you know, meetings and events and, you know, things like um, proms and 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 NSCC graduation, SEREC graduation, we're getting inquiries about weddings. And so it's really just, um, like I said, it's it's been a whirlwind, but so much fun and there's so much hustle and bustle around the civic center and uh i encourage you to, to you know to just come in and see how different it is you know um i'm thinking back to may um was really our first musical event without masks and uh, we packed the house with matt minglewood and his band so it was just really incredible to see um, how much fun people were having and how ready they were to get out. And they're not just ready to come now. I understand via Terry Doyle, the CAO of the town of Port Hawkesbury, that you've been booking events straight up into Christmas. Is that the case? I have. Yeah. Yeah. I've got some, uh, some shows lined up. Um, I can say that Bette and Maynard will be back, uh, for the holidays. We've got a Christmas show booked with, uh, Gunning and Cormier, um, We've got a few shows uh, in the fall coming up as well and uh, right through the summer. So um, we team up quite a bit also with Festival of the Strait. So we support um, support them in their planning and um, a couple of us even volunteer on their on their planning committee. Um, and then with our, even just with our summer programs, we've got a whole um a whole bunch of stuff lined up for the kids this summer as well. Well, as we look towards the summer, Michelle, obviously two major marquee events for the town of Port Hawkesbury coming back this year. The Festival of the Strait, one of the longest running community festivals in the Strait area, and the wildly successful Granville Green free outdoor concert series coming back on Sunday nights beginning on July the 3rd. What does it mean to you as Port Hawkesbury's new Director of Marketing, Recreation, Tourism and Culture to be overseeing your first Granville Green concert, but also the first Granville Green concert that Port Hawkesbury and the surrounding area are seeing in over three years? Yeah, that's a it's a really exciting question. And I think um, anyone in this role uh, would tell you that executing Granville Green is a rite of passage for anybody in this position. Um, it's, you know, it's, it's, been, it's a well branded event. It's been in existence for over well over 25 years. Um, and everybody knows what what Granville Green is. Everybody wants to be at Granville Green. Everybody wants to play at Granville Green. Um, so we really wanted to make it big this year and go in with a bang. So uh, part of the reason, uh, you know, because of that, uh, we renamed the series this year and, and we called it, I'll, sh I'll show you the poster. Yes. So we renamed it Granville Green Resurgence. And Really, the meaning behind that is about uh, emerging from the COVID-19 pandemic and um, creating opportunity for the community to gather again and focusing on um, productive community partnerships, uh, sharing of stories, uh, promoting volunteerism and, and really just unity and sense of community. Um, and so um, this is actually why we chose um, this image from Indigenous artist Marcus Goss, because um, this image represents all of those things. So um, really excited about the lineup. Um, I would say the most the the uh, the media post that's getting the most traffic is the fact that Classified is coming back uh, to Granville Green on August 7th. 
Uh, we have country superstar Robin Ottolini. Um, her song F-150 went viral uh, on TikTok not that long ago. So um, a lot of the young people especially know who Robin Ottolini is. Um, that's July 31st. Um, and in partnership with um, Elise Aaron, who's a total rock star. Um, and so that's kind of... I, I, I kind of dubbed it myself in, in just in my office as sort of the female power night you oh, know wow. yeah so uh That's yeah i'm excited about, about really all of them uh jeremy albino um paired up with john hines for the 24th of july barn bria this is a this is a big one i cannot i can't super group i can't wait for that one um and we've got uh steve mcintyre joining them on july 17th july 10th we've got the stanfields and andre pettipa and the giants and then the very first show kicking off granville green um is uh tyler shaw and so we're really we're really pumped uh that Tyler is coming. He, uh, Tyler's from Vancouver, so he's making a long trip uh, to come and visit us. And he's uh, playing with um, a, a young group called In Echo from Prince Edward Island. So we're very excited to have them cross the bridge and come over and see us. So huge, um, huge lineup. Very exciting. Um, we have a lot of partners that came on board, uh, Bearhead Energy and Everwind being the two uh, sort of huge ones that came on as presenting sponsors. But we've got, you know, some wonderful people at uh, like Steve and the team at Seaboard Tire. Uh, they're supporting our volunteer program. Uh, Port Hawkesbury Paper, BL uh, Environment, East Coast Credit Union, TD Bank, um, Golden Lake Estates, Maple Signs and Engraving. Bob and his team over there have just been super awesome as always. Um, Bob actually is kind of like a personal secretary. Like if you don't follow up with him, he's so great. And he'll just remind you that, hey, you must have got busy and forgot to touch base with me. So I just I love that about him. And he's so organized and uh, just such a community minded business. And one other aspect of all of this excitement that will really hit home with our Talil audience, you are from West Derishat, so you grew up knowing what Granville Green is. So can you talk a bit about being at the helm of this concert series, having had these memories of this concert series, and now being able to put this lineup together? It's very cool. Like, I think, you know, I've been doing events for 20 years, so it's, it's, um, really cool to be able to do it right here at home and influence that and you know be the person that you know gets to pick and worry about if everybody likes it and it's it's really just all part of the excitement but when i think about granville green i think about um you know the fact that it's a very uh, family oriented event um that it really promotes um that feeling of of gathering and community and i that I really wanted that reflected in the themes this year um, for that reason, you know, because when I think about Granville Green, I think about um, people with their babies in strollers and their little kids all dressed up and dancing in front of the stage and sort of those really, um, um, I don't know how to say it, but like a, like a family um, oriented music. environment. Yeah. yeah in the spirit of music and gathering and, family it's kind of like a great big party you know it does have a street fair feel to it doesn't it it absolutely does and i think that's part of the flair and part of the part of the attraction so i think you'll see people come from all over and i think people are ready to come yeah. you know and uh, and and gather um i'd be remiss if i didn't mention uh sort of the last the last few of our sponsors uh dominic and the team at canadian tire have uh, come forward to help us out uh, Maritime Inn, they are just phenomenal people. Uh, Donna Kerrigan is the best, and they're so easy to work with, and I appreciate them so much. Um, and then Jake and the team at The Reporter, always. Um, the team at 101.5 The Hawk, I mean, it doesn't get any better than this. Um, and then um, George and the folks at A1 Pizza, they're just super super community minded community investing type of people and and um we're just so appreciative of everyone who's come forward to help us this year 
So, Michelle, you've previewed the Granville Green series, and we've talked a bit about the Festival of the Strait, but there's obviously much more happening in Port Hawkesbury, including some summer programs that haven't happened in a few years now. Can you give us a preview of what people are going to be able to participate in as they take part in the Port Hawkesbury summer programs? Uh, well, yeah, absolutely. We're getting actually a lot of inquiries about our summer camp that we've been running the last couple of years, and that's going to start the first week of July. So, um, again, we moved um, just just recently we moved to all online registration for our program so um, people can get more information by just visiting townofporthawksbury.ca slash recreation and they can create um, their program registration account there you can register online you can pay online uh, it's super convenient and it takes about five minutes to get set up so um, really exciting and then um, apart from the summer camp we you know we always try and offer a nice little variety of recreation and leisure programs so we've got some fun uh, we've got a track and field fun day we've got scavenger hunts planned we've got a drive-in movie planned um, and then as always you know a few more things too but we as always we have our free um, recreation equipment loan program so you can call us anytime if you want to borrow some outdoor games or sporting equipment and we can help you out with that. Just out of curiosity, what kind of athletic equipment does the town have to rent? Uh, we have tennis rackets, basketballs, um, different types of sport equipment. We have some outdoor games like like um, cornhole and and things like that. Uh, we're looking. We have an e-bike program that we're is just currently under review right now, so that'll be coming out uh, pretty soon. Uh, we'll be uh, renting out e-bikes. Um, and then we're looking at um, maybe doing some small watercraft rentals too. So stay tuned for more information on that coming soon. And just as we're winding down this interview, Michelle, obviously this is a team effort here in Port Hawkesbury. It's not just you as the Director of Marketing, Recreation, Tourism and Culture. There are a whole lot of people that work with you. Why don't you finish up by giving them a bit of a shout out and talking about what the atmosphere is like here in your office? Absolutely. Like, I mean, we work with every program. We work interdepartmentally. We collaborate with all other departments. Um, the girls at the front, Annie and Kelly, they're just the right hand people. So when you come into the Civic Center, um, they're sitting right up at the front. They're our front facing people, you know, come in and say hi and say thank you to them because they're amazing. Um, we work with the Public Works Department with, you know, our needs that we have there. For example, Granville Green, you know, and the road closures and, you know, things like that they always support us and then our parks and facilities team always um, Gordy and Catherine um, they do all of our setups for um, in the Civic Center and with the they do all the parks and beyond uh, town beautification if uh, if you see flowers uh, around town that's because of all the people that we work with and the facilities team and our wonderful summer students that we have um, contributing to all of our programs so it really is a full team effort Terry is a is a great leader and uh, the other directors here um, so yeah I mean it's just you 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 could say thank you a million times every day um, volunteers um, supporting businesses uh, it really does take a village and uh, these are all our little babies so I uh, I thank everybody so much well, we've covered a lot of ground here, Michelle, as I thought we might. Do you have anything else you'd like to add? Yeah, I mean, I think just to just to reiterate, when if you're looking for information on our programs, it's townofporthawksbury.ca slash recreation. If you need help getting set up with a registration account, please let us know. Follow us on on Facebook and Instagram, uh, especially to get all the news and updates about Granville Green and what's happening there. Um on the rain dates, we will move into the Civic Center, so it's import important to note that. Um, and we will send out all that messaging through social media, so it's important to follow, uh, follow us on there and uh, get the most up-to-date and uh, accurate information. Well, we appreciate all this information you've given us, Michelle Farrell, Port Hawkesbury's Director of Marketing, Recreation, Tourism and Culture. Thank you so much for giving me a couple of minutes in the middle of a busy time to speak to us on Tail Hill 24-7. It's always my pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. And now here's the first of our two updates from Richmond Municipal Council's Committee of the Whole meeting, which took place at the Arishat Council Chambers on Monday, June the 13th. It turns out that Richmond might be closer than ever to getting broadband coverage spread all over the county, and we're going to get an update from Develop Nova Scotia on how that's going. Here's Richmond Warden Amanda Mumberkett to give us that update right now. 
So this was really uh, just on the agenda to notify the public that on June 1st, uh, several members of council attended a virtual update from Develop Nova Scotia regarding the broadband rollout specific to Richmond County progress. A uh, few key points I wanted to mention uh, that Develop Nova Scotia provided us is that uh, based on their estimates the, uh, and the design drawings that they have right now, uh, there will be 93 people underserved in Richmond County at the end of 2023 by their estimations. So um, if we could get to that, I think we'll be in a lot better shape than what we are right now. Um, but of course, I know 2023 can't come soon enough for some folks uh, who are underserved now. Um, the bulk of the work that they have ongoing right now is in the make ready stage, which is clearing brush, poles, permits, etc., crossing waterways, railroad tracks, and 100 series highways can often cause delays and change the infrastructure requirements. So it's really difficult for them to pinpoint specific dates sometimes. Um, but they have uh, changed their web page, and I think the URL is internet developns.ca um, and you can now search by community and so if you put your community name in there um, we just wanted members of the public to be aware you can search by community and it will bring up a map uh, of your area that you can where you can see kind of the timeline and uh, and what the coverage will be uh, for your area and basically what we've learned is that on the maps if you're in the red zone the intent is that you, you know, is that if you're served by commercial power, then you can get coverage as a part of their rollout. So that's really great news. It provided us with some certainty, mm -hmm. um, I think, on behalf of our constituents. Um, also wanted to mention uh, to the public that the service delivery agreement for 10 years uh, that they have with the service provider means that the service provider must meet certain technical customer service, scalability, and cri pricing criteria for those 10 years, and Develop Nova Scotia it, you know, has a plan in place to monitor that. So that's really good news. Um, and yeah, I, I have a little note uh, about requesting staff to add Develop Nova Scotia presentation to the website, but they've already done that. Mm -hmm. And I, uh, so I was really glad to see that up there, and um, so would encourage members of the public um, to, to check that out on our website. Yeah, I thought it was a great presentation, and, and like you said, Madam Morton, I mean, people can go on to this to this link into this website, and punch in a an address, and if you're in red, your your zone is in red, then mm -hmm. you're good to go. Yeah. You know, so that's right. It's uh, yeah, it's very encouraging and exciting. Yeah. So. Yeah. Great to hear the granular level of planning when they can yeah. tell us that 93 people will be left underserved and then they will be looking in the next stage for solutions yeah. for those folks. It's pretty pretty yeah. granular. Yeah, it's something we had asked for the last time and they weren't quite sure, so it's yeah. nice to yeah. see that. Yeah, nice to number. see that. Yeah. Exactly. The town of Mulgrave has several important things in common with the communities of Richmond County and the town of Port Hawkesbury. For one thing, they've just passed a municipal budget and for another thing, several popular outdoor events are about to spring back to life after two years of the COVID deep freeze. To get the skinny on what's happening in Mulgrave these days and what we can look forward to over the summer, I sat down on the Mulgrave waterfront with town councillor and former Richmond County resident, Krista Luddington. Here's that interview from Mulgrave right now. And we're pleased to welcome back to Tell Hill 24 seven, direct from the Mulgrave waterfront, Town Councillor Krista Luddington. Krista, thank you for joining me once again. Oh, Adam, thank you so much for having me. It's always a pleasure. Well, the biggest reason we wanted to have you back on the show is to talk about the atmosphere around the Mulgrave Town Council table. You're nearly midway through your first council term, and you're not the only newer face on Mulgrave Town Council. Can you basically give me a sense on how things have been going over the last little while? Yeah, so I dare say that things are going very well, um, but there's always challenges, no matter what council table or what table in general that you're sitting around. Um, there's always struggles and learning curves and the whole gamut, right? And so we're certainly no different. Um, being a new councillor to the table, there's been a ton of support from what I'll call the veterans, but the veterans, the, the um, most um, veteran, I guess, around the table would be our mayor and, and he's in his 10th year, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and then we have Councillor uh, Snow and uh, Deputy Mayor Russell, um, and this is their second term. So, you know, we're all relatively new to the um, municipal politics, but there's been an incredible amount of support and residents are really, really great to kind of guide us along as well. Um, so I would say all in all, it's been a wonderful experience and uh, a lot of learning. <laughs> 
Well, of course, along with that learning comes learning how to put a budget together as a municipal council, and that's what you folks have been doing here in Mulgrave for the past little while. The budget came down earlier this month. There were no tax increases in it. Can you give us a little peek behind the scenes, Krista, as to what it's like for the folks in the town of Mulgrave to work on a budget and what you had to do to keep taxes the same? Yeah. So uh, what I will say is we have an incredible group of people in the town office um, who really helped guide and support the whole budget process. Um, so, of course, our CAO, uh, David Gray, he's been a really great um, support in that process, as well as Jim Davis, who um, takes care of the finances. And Jim is well versed. He's worked with the town in the past, as well as the town of Port Hawkesbury, uh, among others. And so we're really fortunate to have people like them at the table to to really guide us. Um, given that we are new, it's a brand new process to try and tackle. Um, and in terms of what had to be done in order to kind of maintain the taxes, we have been kind of um, holding steady. And it's not that things are going, you know, super Superbly well, but we're we're not in the red either, which is really really good. Um, and so we really just had to maintain that balance and do some forward planning, and not just looking at you know this fiscal year, but what's what's the plan in the next three to five fiscal years in terms of paving and that sort of thing, and um, really taking it a step at a time. And in by doing that, we were able to kind of um, look at the bigger picture. And the the biggest goal was to keep taxes as they are. Um, everything is rising you know whether it be gas whether it be uh, furnace oil whether it be groceries it seems like everything around us is experiencing that inflation so we really felt a strong responsibility to um the residents of Mulgrave to kind of hold everything you know at status quo when it comes to that regard Krista, we've seen with neighboring municipalities like Port Hawkesbury and Richmond County that there are often parts of a budget that a municipal council really has no control over. Things like policing costs, things like education costs that go up every year, largely because of decisions at the provincial or federal level. Were there any items like that that Mulgrave had to consider when putting its budget together over the past few months? Yeah, no, absolutely. And I mean, you know, we can only do so much as you're, as you're stating, right? There's these mandatory payments that, you know, we get the bill and, and we are forced to pay them. And so, uh, namely the RCMP, that one saw a really large jump uh, this year we're seeing an 11.04 percent increase um, and that that's a hard pill to swallow in a very small community it's a hard pill to swallow across the province no matter the size of your min municipality or, or town um, but we're a town of 627 people. Our population has decreased according to the census uh, by 13% from 2016 to 2021, um, which is substantial. And so to see that um, RCMP cost go up by 11%, like we're talking in the vicinity of $190,000 now of a budget that's less than 2 million going towards RCMP alone. Um, and so there's, there's discussion around the council table to try and figure out what can we do? Um, we are meeting with the RCMP to try and see if there's a middle ground or even just to um, explain the process of what the ratio, you know, officer to uh, population ratio is and uh, just to try and get a better handle on it to see if we can, whatever we can do in order to make things better. But you know, RCMP being the um, largest mandatory payment, but yeah, like education, everything that we have here um, or that we access in terms of services, taxpayers pay for, right? And so um, I think that's a really important part to to discuss and to talk about so that people recognize that, you know, yes, taxes are high and I'm, I'll be the first one to say it and I will never dispute it. Taxes are high, but um, it is, it's split up as best as we possibly can to provide as many services as possible to the residents here. We've talked about the difficult decisions that have to be made in putting together a budget and trying to keep the tax rates at a stable position. But on the other side of the coin, Krista, I imagine there are one or two items in this budget that town councillors put together and really want people to know that this was a decision that they made for their own good and for the good of the community. Can you point to one or two areas where, say, a spending decision was made that could help people in this regard? 
Yeah, so I can think of two things right off the hop. Uh, number one, our community pool. Um, the pool is something that services the residents here of Mulgrave and, and people in the surrounding communities. Um, it's an asset, but it's an asset that, unfortunately, it doesn't make money, and that's not a secret. It is a cost center. Um, but when you weigh out the cost versus the, the benefit and the value that it adds to the residents and the quality of life here, it's a no-brainer. Like, we're going to do whatever we can in order to maintain that and in order to keep the pool in good standing and you know it's heavily used and we're really fortunate that we have a lot of really great partners including at DSM which provide you know four weeks in the summer where residents don't have to pay to come use the pool it is fully funded um, Heather Brennan accessed another fund that I think covers another two weeks so I believe out of the whole summer there's maybe two weeks where residents have to pay the fees in order to come use the pool um, so that's number one number two is the paving uh, we recognize that you know we're a small town and we're we're responsible for the roads in Mulgrave and we recognize that some of the roads are not in tip-top shape um, and so we've made that a priority and we've looked at again like made a plan over the next n number of fiscal years and in the next three fiscal years we have allocated almost a million dollars into paving um, and so you know what does that look like for this fiscal year we've made a plan and we're waiting on the numbers to get going uh, likely in the fall but we've made a plan for Main Street um, you know we're doing a lot of work for beautification on Main Street and we recognize that you can do all the beautification in the world but if you're still dodging potholes you can't really you know sit back and and enjoy that beautification um, so there's a plan in place in order to uh, pave Main Street it's done down by the harbor it's done um, right up to just by the legion and then there's a, a gap there of about I feel like it's 1.3 kilometers if I'm not mistaken that uh, still needs to be paid so that's on the list as well as uh, McLeod Street which is you know it's a heavily traveled road and uh, in order to get up to the Mulgrave Memorial Center and the fire department and the medical center um, so it is a need and and it's in rough shape so paving is certainly something that we recognize um, in order to be safe in town, we need properly paved roads. Krista, we're filming this interview today on the Mulgrave waterfront, and one of the reasons for that is because you've been very involved in waterfront development in recent days. Of course, as a town council, you sit on the committee for the Mulgraven Area Revitalization Association, or MARA, and I understand that you've been working with that group to try to get some new buildings set up here on the Mulgrave waterfront. Can you tell me about that? Yeah, so we're really, really excited about this potential development. And, and not potential, it is happening. Um, we are launching a pilot project this year, right here on the Mulgrave uh, waterfront. And essentially the project's gonna be called Shops at McNair's Cove. And this kind of aligns really well with the Market by the Sea. Um, Market by the Sea is in their fifth year. And we were looking for an opportunity to grow. Um, and with that, we've all always envisioned some shops right along the, the boardwalk or the walkway here on the waterfront. And so a couple of meetings ago, uh, Joe Brennan and Heather Brennan had been up in Eastern Passage and thought this is exactly what Mulgrave could do or could be and so uh, Joe did up a, some graphics and brought it to the meeting and said you know what if and everybody around the table immediately went yep <laughs> that, that's that's got to happen um, and so with a little bit of work there is a building that isn't being utilized right now that is sitting on the waterfront uh, on the other side closer to the, the wharf um, and so we decided to have the town check it out to see what the condition was in. Uh, it was in great condition and so Mara has um, offered to paint it up a pretty color and the town is going to move it right here on uh, the walkway facing the water and it is going to be available for rent as a pilot project um, for the summer of 2022. So beginning be uh, the first week of July right through probably until the end of September if the weather holds out and and we'll see how it goes. 
So is there a specific usage for this building that's going to be set up here, or could it have multiple uses? How will that work? Yeah, so uh, we're still working that out, but basically what we're hoping for is to have a vendor, any kind of vendor, to come in and uh, set up shop within the building. It, there won't be power or anything like that. It'll be a very basic setup for the first year, and if it goes well, then we grow. Um, you know, ultimately, if we could find one vendor that would take up shop for the, the full season, that would be the dream. Um, and that's what we're going to aim for. But we're, we're open to anybody and everybody who is interested in opening up shop. It might be that it's a weekly thing and it's a different vendor each week. Um, it could be by the day, it could be by the hour. You know, whatever we can attract, um, that's the goal right now is just, just to try and drum up some interest. And uh, again, it, it suits perfectly with Market by the Sea, which is directly across the road from where we're at right now. So that's that's kind of the, the plan. Well, as you're talking about the potential for new buildings here on the waterfront, we are filming this in back of a former visitor information center here in Mulgrave that's been transformed into the front porch, the coffee and ice cream and sweet shop that you find right here in this part of Mulgrave. Does a development like that give you and your fellow town councillors and the Mara committee some hope for the future in terms of waterfront development? 100%. Uh, the Keepings, who are the owners of the front porch, they have been invaluable when it comes to um, Mulgrave and what they've done with this facility. It's beyond what anybody could have ever expected. If you haven't been to the front porch, by God, you got to do it. It is just gorgeous. Uh, the food is delicious and they serve ice cream here in the summer and it, it really is just a wonderful vibe. Um, and I totally agree. You know, we went quite some time without any type of business in Mulgrave aside from um, industrial. And so I think that the residents of Mulgrave were <laughs> long past ready to see things open up again. And they've proven that by the amount of support that the front porch has received. And now it's kind of onward and upward, right? What else can we do? We've seen the success here and they're going to continue to succeed because of who they are and what they do and how well they do it. Um, and now it's what else can we bring to the table? in order to see Mulgrave grow. And while we're on this topic, Krista, we know that the Mulgrave and Area Revitalization Association has been working diligently for quite a few years now to be able to redevelop projects that have been falling by the wayside and just to bring some new interest into Mulgrave and some new facilities for the people here in the surrounding area. Can you talk a bit about that? Yeah, for sure. So uh, one of the main things that we've identified at the Mara table, so first of all, kind of back up a little bit. So Mara was first established back in uh, 2018 when the former school closed down and it was to try and figure out a way in order to um, come up with an idea for the former school building so that number one, it wouldn't have to be torn down because it was a town asset. It is a town asset. And so Mara got to work and uh, within two years, that building had become completely self-sustainable. And so with that, they kind of stepped away. Now that it's self-sustainable, they were going, okay, now what's the next project? Because it's all about revitalizing Mulgrave and area. It's right in the name. And so one of the things that was identified was this area that we're in right now. We have a beautiful waterfront. Um, we had a wharf here that was fully functioning some years ago and uh, due to some weather events over the years and um, just the cost of, of general upkeep that unfortunately had to be closed down. And so now we've identified that as a priority because with um, you know a marina or a wharf available to us, that brings more business to the front porch, that brings more marine traffic in to explore what is going to be shops in McNair's Cove, what it's going to be, you know, the, the market by the sea. Uh, we have the museum across the road from the front porch and uh, so there's there's a lot in the works and so we've identified this as a priority to try and revitalize the the marina so to speak um, so Mara has been doing an incredible amount of work trying to gather quotes to find funding opportunities um, to do whatever we can in order to make this uh, a viable uh, location again for marine traffic. So uh, a big, big shout out, shout out to everyone who is involved in Mara. We've got some incredible people around the table and uh, people who, you know, really genuinely care about the town and its growth. Krista, as much as there is to celebrate here in Mulgrave and as much as there is to anticipate 
The town is also dealing with two high-profile departures that have come in recent weeks. You have a new temporary recreation director because the longtime rec director for Mulgrave, Heather Brennan, recently stepped away from her position after 14 years on the job. Now, obviously, you folks are looking for a full-time replacement, but in the meantime, can you discuss a little bit about what Heather Brennan's legacy has meant for you and meant for the town in general, and how you build on that reputation and legacy that Heather Brennan has left behind as you go forward into the future? Yeah, 100%. I mean, what I can say is I moved here going on six years ago, and when we first moved to the community, we didn't know anybody, and we got the first, we moved in August, we got the first newsletter, community newsletter in September, and we knew we wanted to get involved, but we didn't know who to talk to or where to go or, you know. Um, going through that newsletter, there was one prominent name that kept popping up, and it was Heather Brennan. And so it was like, okay, she's the gal. So reached out to her and she has been nothing short of wonderful. Um, it was very apparent very early on that Heather was, is, will always be the heartbeat of the community. Um, she has done so much, you know, for seniors, for the, you know, little littles, the toddlers, the school age kids, the adults, everybody in between. Um, Heather has done an incredible amount of work to support and to just add to the quality of life for the people here in Mulgrave. Um, you know, she's worked on some really great projects, including bringing the Trans Canada uh, Walking Trail to Mulgrave. Uh, that was completely her baby. Um, one of the last things that she did before she left her position was uh, the opening of the Ocean View Fitness Center up at Mulgrave Memorial Center. Uh, that opened in October of 2021 and with an incredible amount of work and fundraising efforts and you know gathering a committee of, of um, dedicated volunteers to make this a go and it is and it's thriving and it is single-handedly because of Heather. Um, you know, she has promised, and I'm going to hold her to it, that <laughs> although she's not um, in the recreation and physical activity uh, coordinator position anymore, um, you know, we all know where she lives. So <laughs> she's going to continue to uh, stay involved. She is remaining on the Mara committee, on the Market by the Sea committee, uh, the fitness center. So although she's gone, you know, today is midweek and I've already had two meetings with her uh, just this week alone. So uh, I know that she is, uh, you know, moving on and we're really delighted to see her, um, you know, jump into her next kind of adventure. And um, but we're sad to see her go because she is just such an asset to the town. And with all of that community participation in mind, Krista, I imagine it was a happy and yet bittersweet moment when it was announced that Heather Brennan was the recipient of an award from the Strait Area Chamber of Commerce, specifically the Kevin Beaton Heart of the Community Award presented just last month at the Civic Center. Can you talk a bit about that? Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, we were we were thrilled to see that she was chosen for the recipient. I mean, we didn't even have to go in to look at the description of the award. The name said it all. The Heart of the Community Award. Heather Brennan like that's that's exactly who it described um, so it couldn't have gone to a more well-deserving recipient um, and then it was re like just after that was announced that she had let us know that and there were tears it was not an easy decision for her to make uh, that she let us know she would be leaving this position for another and it was like so bittersweet because it was the perfect ending to a wonderful career and uh, what a great way to highlight that so no we were uh, certainly super sad to see her go but really really happy to see what's coming next for her well it'll be good to see heather brennan around town sadly another recent departure from mulgrave's day-to-day -day living a longtime former fire chief mike breen won't be seen in these parts of course we have gotten to know mike and his wife evangeline or vangie as many call her here very well i know the passing of mike breen hit home for you and your family krista because your husband jay had become the new fire Fire chief several months earlier, but of course had worked with Mike before that time. Can you tell us a little bit about the legacy Mike Breen leaves behind here in Mulgrave? Absolutely. I mean, he and his wife Evangeline have given just about their entire lives to this town. Um, you know, volunteer work is, is quite oftentimes a, a thankless job, and uh, they have done it for a very, very, very long time. 
and you know seeing the impact that uh, both Mike and Evangeline have had on the community you can't even put it into words they've done so much and uh, really really sad to see um, Mike's passing you know he has contributed so much of his time uh, I think the combination between the two it was like close to 80 years I want to say of volunteer time that they've devoted to this community and uh, that certainly uh, deserves to be recognized. On a brighter note Krista this is a big summer for Mulgrave with COVID-19 restrictions being lifted and a lot more big events planned for the town over the next couple of months including a significant milestone for a longtime community event. Can you tell us a little more about that? This summer, I think, is going to be one for the books. Um, The last two years, we've had to scale down or not do things at all due to COVID. And uh, so it's nice to see that things are safely beginning to open up. And uh, we are really, really looking forward to it. Scotia Days is going to be a big celebration. It's from uh, July 8th to the 17th. It's a 10-day festival for a small little town. And uh, they do festivals big here. That's one thing I can say. It's the 40th anniversary for Scotia Days. So So, you know, if you've ever uh, attended Scotia Days in the past, you know that it's big. It's going to be bigger. (laughs) So make sure to uh, come out to the events. It's it's a wonderful opportunity to explore the town, uh, meet the wonderful people who live here and uh, see fireworks like you've never seen before. As well, we have the uh, Market by the Sea. I alluded to uh, that earlier, that it's our fifth year anniversary. And uh, we're coming in big this year as well. Um, There's four dates, July 14th, 28th, August 11th, and 25th. Um, And what that is, it's every second Thursday night from 6 to 7.30 in McNair's Cove Park, which is... Not sure if you can see, it's right behind us there. Uh, You'll see a band shell. There's uh, market vendors that line Logie Street. So it's an outdoor market concert series. Um, And so we've got the artist lineup that uh, has just been released where we have Barn Brea for the first um, event on July 14th, which is uh, Morgan Tony, Keith Mullins, Isabella Sampson and Jesse Cox. Then on the 28th of July, we've got um, Jim Ralph and Michael Young. So that's going to be a really fun duo. Um, you know, kind of the the veteran and the up and comer coming together for a wonderful show. Um, and then on the uh, 11th of August, we have Jordan Musician from the CBRM, who uh, is known through the uh, Cape Breton Summertime Review and Tis the Season show. He's just a stellar guy, wicked entertainer. And then closing out the series on August 25th, we have uh, Town, which is a group from Guysboro, and that's uh, Jessica and Greg Favreau and a group of their friends coming in to join them. So it's going to be a really, really great summer. And if you know, we're always open to visitors. If you've never been to Mulgrave, you got to come. If you've been before, we'd love to see you again. We've covered a lot of ground in just a short time. Krista, did you want to add anything else just before we wrap up here? Um, well, I'd love to say that a huge thanks to the community members here in town. It no matter what we do, um, whether it's around the table, whether it's the various organizations in town, um, everybody has a common goal and the community members recognize that and support it. So uh, big thanks to to everybody in town for that, as well as I want to send a shout out to Mayor Chisholm, uh, who has been working incredibly hard like the rest of council. Um, You'll notice going through town that there's a lot of work being done on the the replacement of the, the new bridge. And, you know, he's a big part of that. Um, He spends every single day on his lunch break uh, making phone calls and you know he is never not working for the town so uh, just a a big shout out to Mayor Chisholm and uh, to the rest of council Uh, it's been a pleasure and can't wait to see what the next two years bring many of our tell ill viewers might be familiar with the Babbins Hill look-off well it turns out that came up as a topic of conversation at the most recent committee of the whole meeting for Richmond Municipal Council as a matter of fact, one of Isle Madame's two sitting councillors, Michael Digden, brought it up as a conversation piece because he'd like to see some improvements taking place at the Babbins Hill look-off. Here is Councillor Digden explaining what he'd like to see happen. Uh, right on the Babbins Hill look-off, uh, the County of Richmond owns the PID number 75178897, which is right from the corner to go down on the low road. Um, to the look off right now, which is possible almost an acre of property. Um, we also own the property 
on the lower road um, to the ocean. So I just like to bring the, you know, I've had many residents in my area look to expand or look off and it's a great location for somebody to pull over. It's probably one of our, probably one of our highest peak points where you can still see, you know, one of the lighthouses. Um, you can still see right across the whole street. Um, I know uh, the, uh, they're looking at, I believe, Margaret Herdman and some of the others are looking at putting a, I don't want to say a plaque, but a... Interpretive panel. Yeah, interpretive panel right there as well. So, uh, you know, it's a, I just think it's a great time and a great investment for us to expand that, to make it a little bigger. So I don't know if we want to, how we go about, I guess, reaching out to staff to look at clearing that property. I guess would be my recommendation or... Okay, so it's kind of a discussion on the feasibility of that. Is that what you're... Yeah, and, and I don't know. I mean, it's like everything else, money out always, isn't always money in, but again, it's just, it's a great look. It's a great look-off point for anybody mm -hmm. coming onto the island. So it's, uh, you know, you capture all the boats coming in out of the street. You can see straight across. You can see the lighthouse. It's just, it's a great look-off point for everybody. Okay. It is... It's still look off now, but people can still go and park and... They can, but it's limited to two or three cars at most. Yeah. Um, I think there's one picnic table. There's, there's one, one picnic table, table, so it's just, uh, yeah. And again, the um, I, I walked it several times. Um, it probably extends almost another 100 feet past the... So the upper part, um, where it's, I guess, barriered off, <coughs> goes over the side of an embankment. But when you actually walk down maybe 50 feet or so, you can walk out almost another 100, past, 100 feet past where um, we could ex extend it or expand it. I personally have no, like I said before, I personally have no problem clearing the land and giving the wood to whoever right. wants it. But I guess as a counselor, we're not allowed just to cut our own wood. <laughs> no, no. It'd be some serious liability issues with that. Um, but, okay, so I, is your, I guess your request then is to... Um, perhaps, perhaps ask staff to do a little bit of an assessment or an yeah. initial uh, investigation into what's possible, or is that? I, I guess, yeah, maybe, you know, I, it might be a multi-step project, so yeah. if clearing the trees is number one, then maybe we can ask staff at getting a quote on just, you know, removing the, right. removing the trees from that area. Yeah. yeah. I think I before think a hazard we, assessment would probably I think be a number exactly, one piece, right? I like think, whether or not it's yeah. it's safe to do so. Like it appears safe to you and I'm not um, could be safe. I don't know, yeah. but I don't know. Right. So I think the number one piece would be to ask, you know, yeah. sounds like a great plan, yeah. but just to ask staff to assess like whether it can be done and if it could what would that even look like? Yeah. Okay. I, I think it's a probably a bigger project than we may think it is. Yeah. I agree. So, um, so perhaps we could just refer this back to you, Karen, to dis discuss with Public Works. And um, I think we need to keep in mind that this is a, again a really busy time of year for Public Works staff. Yes. So, you know, maybe you know, in terms of expectation, probably not a lot going to happen uh, this build season. But, um, but I think it would be at least start with a conversation. We could maybe leave it there. Yeah. That so it is kind of like a new project which we haven't you know, assigned budget for or right. whatever, mm -hmm. so right. we'd have to yeah. put a little bit of thinking into what that potentially could be, and we'll get back to you. Okay, thank you. All right. Thanks. Thank you, Councillor Dickton. And now, wrapping up Tail Hill 24-7 with our world-famous Fast Five game, here's Mulgrave Town Councillor Krista Luddington answering my foolish questions on the Mulgrave waterfront. And joining us now to play Talil 24-7's Fast Five game on the Mulgrave waterfront is Town Councillor Krista Luddington. Are you all ready to play the Fast Five? Oh, goodness, I'm ready. All right, let's go. First question, coffee, tea, or neither? Coffee. What are you taking your coffee? Cream. Cream sounds good. All right, next question. I have watched this movie 50 times. I would watch it another 50. What is that movie? Oh, goodness, I'm not a movie watcher. Uh, oh. Coyote Ugly. Coyote Ugly. <laughs> You're the first to ever say that movie. That, that's kind of a hoot. So you heard it right here, folks. Crystal Luddington can't fight the moonlight. She really can't. All right. Next question. Dream vacation. Scotland. 
Scotland, you say? Yeah, I've never been, but it's on the bucket list. Oh, that's marvelous. I'll say it's on my bucket list too, so that's marvelous. You can be an animal of any sort for one day. What is that animal? Oh, man, a lion. A lion. Yeah, yeah. We went to the Oak Lawn Zoo not that long ago, and the lions were the best because they just sprawled out and slept all day long. They were so relaxed, but they can be fierce when they want to. Yeah. All right. That is an excellent answer. You can be the lion on the Nova Scotia flag, so that's great. <laughs> and wrapping up the Fast Five with Krista Luddington, would you rather be a forest or a tree? Oh, a tree. Why a tree? Well, because then the other trees around me will protect me, just like our communities. <laughs> she wants to be a tree for security. <laughs> I like that. There, that wasn't so bad, was it? Oh, goodness. No, you make it easy. Okay, I'm glad. I'm glad. Krista Luddington is a Mulgrave Town Councillor and is the latest volunteer, or victim, shall we say, for the infamous Talil 24-7 Fast Five. And there you have it, folks. That wraps up this week's edition of Talil 24-7. Thank you for tuning in, and a big thank you to my interview guests this week, Michelle Farrow and Krista Luddington. And major thanks to my colleagues here at Little Community Television, Cody Party, Nick Boudreau, and Becky Borino, for filming and formatting of the footage from Richmond Council's Committee of the Whole, and for filming the studio shots that you're seeing right now. If you have any comments or thoughts about what you've seen over the past hour, or just some ideas or suggestions for future editions of Telil 24-7, I'd love to hear them. You can contact me directly. My phone number is 902-625-8863. And you can reach me by email using the address adamjrcook, cook with an e, at gmail.com. You can also contact Halil Community Television directly. The phone number for the studio in Arishat is 902-226-1928. And the best email address to use is talil at talil.tv. As always, you can follow Talil Community Television on social media. We're on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube. And our YouTube channel features every single edition of Talil 24-7, including this one, and the individual segments and interview clips from the show, as well as every episode of our sister programs, Roundtable and Note Cote. For now, I'm Adam Cook. Thanks once again for tuning in to Talil 24-7. I look forward to seeing you again next week with a brand new show. Bye for now.